CST uh, and Institute of Nanoscience and Technology when we jointly instituted this Hargobind Kurana lecture series and uh, uh, after the first lecture was delivered by Professor Venkataraman Ramakrishnan, the Nobel laureate, uh, uh, some of his associates contacted us reading this in the media and they, uh, you know, came to meet us. One of the scientists came to meet us and uh, the very next year, 2017, about 25 of them descended here in Punjab and we had a special event. Uh, so, so that's the kind of nostalgia we have. That's the kind of, uh, you know, uh, festivity associated with this lecture series. Uh, so they all shared their uh, memories with Professor Khurana. We have these all compiled. They are available on our website as well. Just want to read one uh, here. You know. So this is Dr. David Jones who had worked with uh, Govind, as they fondly call him, uh, at Wisconsin between 1963 and 1965. The, the small article that he shared with us, he named it My Kurana Experience. Uh, so he said that, uh, uh, I came to his lab with a degree in chemistry and was very unsure when he told me that he wanted me to work in the field of biochemistry, microbiology. When I told him this, his reply was one I have never forgotten. David, all I need from you is enthusiasm. And so it proved. Uh, PS is here. So wish to share with you that uh, not only at this point of time, we have very strong STI ecosystem in Punjab. It is filled with enthusiasm, energy, to contribute to growth of the state, to contribute to growth of nation. Uh, thank you uh, for being here. And uh, we also have Chief Secretary here. With that, I'll request uh, uh, Anurag Varmaji, uh, who's the Principal Secretary, Science, Technology, Environment, Punjab. Sir, please uh, look forward to your opening remarks. Mm. A very good morning to all of you. It is a matter of profound privilege for me to welcome Dr. K. Vijay Raghavan, Principal Scientific Advisor to Government of India, Shri Anirudh Tewadi, IES, Chief Secretary, Punjab, and Professor Gagandeep Kang, country's eminent virologist. I am also glad that Professor Arun Grover, ex Vice Chancellor, Punjab University, Professor Amitav Patra, Director, Institute of Nanoscience and Technology, and directors and heads of various other institutions along with their faculty and students have joined there. Atam Nibhartha is the keystone of the new science and technology and innovation policy of India. I'm glad to share that with the foresight to support the country in this endeavor, government of Punjab has already launched Mission Innovate Punjab with the vision to make state a hub of research and innovation. As, as a further step towards robust data architecture, state strengths on key STI indicators are being mapped and strategies are being developed to augment the same. Further, we are also working to develop strong community of researchers within the state. I'm also glad to share that state of Punjab is taking focused initiatives to explore and, deep, and deploy technological solutions to address state's grand challenges. We have also promoted technic technological interventions for cleaner, cleaner production, which have been adopted by a large number of industries. The fifth Hargobind Khurana lecture is being organized today under Hargobind Khurana lecture series instituted jointly by Punjab State Council for Science and Technology and Institute of Nanoscience and Technology as a tribute to the Nobel Laureate Professor Kurana. Under this series, every year, a Nobel Laureate or an eminent scientist of similar stature is invited to deliver the lecture. All of you would be happy to know that Punjab has been, a, for, Punjab has been fortunate to listen to a galaxy of eminent scientists who delivered previous Hargobind Kurana lectures. 
These include Nobel laureate Professor Venkataraman Ramakrishnan, President Royal Society, World Food Laureate Professor G. S. Khush, Professor Uttam Raj Bhandari, Lester Wolf Professor of Molecular Biology, MIT, and Professor Asim Ansari, Founder, U.S. India Scholar Exchange Khurana Program. We are equally fortunate to have have with us Professor uh, Gagandeep Kang, who, who was a guiding light for the country during the tough times. She has been very kind to agree to deliver fifth Hargobin Khurana lecture today. I'm sure her talk on developing vaccines with and without a pandemic is going to ignite the in intellectual spark among the young minds. I'm happy to see a large number of students from various schools, colleges, engineering colleges, universities, and R&D institutions who have joined us through digital mode. I'm sure that the talk by today's dignitaries would fill them with enthusiasm to explore marvels of science and their potential for the benefit of mankind. Thank you very much. Jai Hind. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Anirudh Tiwadi, uh, Chief Secretary Punjab with us. He has also uh, served as Principal Secretary Science, Technology, Environment earlier. Having closely worked with him, the bond with him is really special. Thank you, sir, for taking our time to be here. Request for your special address. Mm. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ora. Uh, and uh, uh, very good morning to all of you. Uh, my most respected Dr. Vijay Raghavan, uh, I remember uh, uh, interacting with him in one of my previous assignments as Principal Secretary Science Technology Environment, as Jitendra was mentioning, when he was Secretary DBT Government of India. And of course, we have some very uh, mutual friends, uh, and we keep talking about him. Uh, esteemed uh, Professor Gangandeep Kang, I don't think we can all repay our debt to you for the great work that you have done for all of us during this uh, <clears throat> pandemic. Uh, Dr. Grover, Professor Mitab Patra, my colleagues uh, Anurag Verma and uh, Dr. Rora, and friends from the science and tech community who are all present here, uh, uh, scientists, uh, professors, academicians, ladies and gentlemen. It's always a humbling experience for me uh, to be uh, part of uh, such a gathering where such great minds are, uh, you know, sitting together virtually today, but otherwise we have all been, uh, uh, you know, interacting uh, physically as well in the past. Uh, and I must say that uh, of all the assignments that I have had uh, in my career uh, of uh, 30, 32 years, uh, Principal Secretary Science Technology was perhaps one of the most rewarding careers. And I thoroughly enjoyed it and some special moments I had, uh, I, 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 the, I actually took that opportunity to visit almost all the great institutes that are present in uh, uh, Chandigarh and Mohali <clears throat> and interact with great minds for working there. And uh, let me tell you, I mean, I would always uh, come back with uh, uh, awe and uh, inspiration, insp get inspired from these uh, wonderful scientists who would be working there. And uh, what a good coincidence that uh, last night, you know, uh, as I was going through the papers uh, for this meeting, uh, I, I got a <clears throat> text from Professor Satyamurthy, uh, our former director of Pfizer. Uh, I mean, it's just a casual uh, text uh, remembering each other. And it was so nice to, you know, uh, get this short message from him. And I'm sure uh, I'll convey uh, uh, greetings from all of you also uh, to him when I respond to his text uh, today. Uh, so it's 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 always nice. It's always very humbling to be part of this uh, part of such a community. And I would like to compliment uh, the Institute of Nanoscience Technology and uh, uh, the Punjab State Council for Science and Technology for jointly instituting this. Uh, Hargobind Khurana lecture series to commemorate the great uh, Dr. Khurana. Uh, it's also a matter of uh, immense pride for us that he did have his roots and he did have his connection with Punjab. And that's a special bond that we have with him. And of course, uh, uh, the, the, his contribution to uh, the field of genetics and molecular biology has, of course, been immense. And we are all very proud of it. Uh, we all know that this year also marks the 100th birth anniversary of uh, uh, 
uh, anniversary year of Professor Khurana, which we all are celebrating. Uh, remembering him, I mean, as uh, uh, Dr. Rora just mentioned about a small uh, anecdote uh, about uh, his talking to his uh, students, saying that what he needed really was enthusiasm. And what a what a great uh, you know a piece of wisdom. Uh, because if 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 you have enthusiasm, you can do everything. And if you lack it, despite all knowledge that you may have, despite all resources you may have, probably the results would not come. Uh, we we are we are all lucky that uh, the kind the legacy that he has left for all of us has really been transformational in the field of uh, genes and genomes and which has paved, paved the way for great research uh, including uh, what we uh, had to face during this uh, pandemic uh, i think uh, we all have uh, as a generation this was perhaps uh, for for common commoners like me this was our first brush with uh, a pandemic we had only heard about it uh, uh the, the one that stuck the <clears throat> that struck the world in 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 early 20th century <clears throat> but the way i think the entire community the human community responded to it is 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 great uh, i i think whether it was uh the industry whether it was the scientists whether it were governments whether it was businesses the way we all responded to the challenges that this pandemic threw uh, at us it is it it, it is it, it is so great because uh, we saw people reengineering their processes, business processes. We saw people uh, switching over to, uh, uh, to, to to digital communication and the kind of uh, 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 progress that we saw in uh, working through the digital technology was immense. And the fact that today we all are sitting together and uh, are able to discuss and exchange our views is perhaps one of the uh, one of one of the uh, benefit. I mean unintended benefits if i may use that word of the pandemic because prior to this it was not that technology was not there but the kind of use that we all did of this technology <clears> of <throat> digital communication and one of the best uh, 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 Yusuf, uh one of the best things about this technology also is that we all started dot at 10 a.m otherwise uh, i i don't recall a seminar or a meeting starting dot at 10 a.m and we, we would all get together in physical mode one of us would surely get late traffic jams or whatever we may say so the kind of response that the community gave and the kinds of response that the governments gave uh, i i think they were great we all stood by each other we all uh, uh, you know looked after each other we all cared for the ones who had lost their jobs the ones who were in dire need of food the government stepped up to provide relief uh, to those who really needed it at the at that point of time and I think the scientific community really stepped up, uh, stepped up its uh, game. Uh, the the speed at which uh, the vaccine has come out, and I mean, I mean, I think who knows it better than Professor Kang, and we are so lucky to hear her today, because uh, I I do recall a very small incident, and I must share this with you. Uh, you know, it was uh, sometimes in early February uh, 2020. And uh, I was the finance secretary at that point of time, and I had prepared, uh, 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 the, you know, the first draft of our budget, the state budget, which was supposed to be presented in uh, March. And when I went to went to the then chief secretary, Dr. Karnavtar Singh, and uh, I showed him the numbers, he said, "Well, these numbers are okay, but have you put in a, a provision for the pandemic?" I you know, I was just taken aback. What is this pandemic thing? I said, "No." What's that? So he says, no, no, have you have been following the news in uh, what's happening in China. I said, yes, but it's in China. Uh, it's fine. I mean, uh, we, we don't get affected by it. He said, no, 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 no. Uh, trust me. Uh, he's been a, a student of uh, economics and statistics. Uh, he's probably done some work in epidemiology also. So he actually warned me. He says, no, this is going to come and it's going to hit hard. So uh, acting on his advice, I actually made a provision of uh, uh, 300 crores initially. And I told, he said, make it 500. I said, no, 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 I don't have resources. I'll make 300 and if we required, we'll make it 500 because of, during the course of the year. And uh, honestly, when I briefed the finance minister, I was saying, you know, this is such a useless kind of uh, provisioning of 300 crores that the chief secretary has made me do it. But trust me, that was one provision that came in really handy for the government at that point of time, because I was able to provide resources to uh, our health department to our relief uh, uh, to our uh, relief and rehabilitation department uh, to 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 combat the first effects that COVID threw at us. Uh, and uh, well, uh, he uh, I mean I do recall that we were when we were discussing he would say you know take it two years and I one would wonder you know two years. He says till the time the vaccine comes in uh, there's going to be no relief. Uh, 
and he says it almost takes two years to get a vaccine. But uh, what a great work that the scientific community has done. I mean, uh, I think the first vaccine, if uh, I recall correctly, was probably done by in about nine to ten months uh, when we first heard of it. And today, uh, I mean, billions of doses have uh, been administered. And uh, uh, as far as we are concerned, thanks to uh, you know Professor Kang and her great team of scientists, that today in the country we are almost back to normal. We are almost back to normal as far as our normal economic activity is concerned. Uh, we, in, on our part in the government, have been trying to help the uh, scientific community. We've tried to set up labs. We've tried to provide other resources, whatever have been uh, desired of us. And I think working together, we have all been able to combat this uh, pandemic. And uh, I'm sure all of us are very eager to listen to Professor Kang because that journey is going to that uh, journey is going to be very very impressive. Uh, I'm grateful to uh, Professor Agwan. Uh, that he has been a guiding force to the community uh, uh, throughout the country and the kind of support and inspiration actually and is and one thing which I have always seen about uh, Professor Agwan is, is the enthusiasm. Uh, Dr. Rora, you talked about enthusiasm. His enthusiasm, whether it was the BIRAC meetings or in the biotechnology that I have had, is 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 so infectious if I may use that word. And uh, he always pushes all of us around. Thank you so much, sir, for being here. And uh, uh, thank you, Professor Kang, for. Uh, Agreeing to deliver this lecture, I'm sure all of us here are going to immense uh, to to really benefit immensely uh, from your rich experience and your journey. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Jai Hind. Thank you, sir. And uh, I must share that the recent enthusiasm that we see in Professor Vijay Raghavan is to strengthen the center state connect. You would recall he had re uh, recently connected with you on this and he, ha he had taken a meeting of all the states and uh, you know, I'm sure with that vision uh, so you have in mind, uh, as I said, we have the, the ecosystem in Punjab is hungry for this connect now and I think this is the right stage that we are, uh, that you are uh, uh, you know, laying emphasis on this. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, right away, I invite you to kindly address the address all of us. Mm. Professor, thank you very Kena. much. Thank you very much, Dr. Jatinder Kaur, uh, Chief Secretary, Mr. Tiwari, uh, Mr. Anurag Verma, uh, Professor Grover, um, Professor Ramita Patra, and of course, uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Gagandeep Khan, who's going to give the lecture shortly. Um, it's It's wonderful to be here. And it's really also very special that we are uh, going to hear a lecture honoring uh, Dr. Hargobind Khurana. Um, you know, Punjab has produced so many top scientists, and that's a well-kept secret, probably known uh, primarily to Dr. Grover and very few others. Uh, uh, that needs to be publicized a lot. Uh, and, you know, this is uh, from pre-independence Punjab. Uh, Professor Yashpal, um, uh, Professor, uh, you know, uh, um, Chandra, Dr. Chandrasekhar was born in uh, Lahore. Abdus Salam was born uh, in, you know, uh, Punjab. And these three people were born in places, I think, a few kilometers from each other. And they actually uh, did work which changed the world in enormous ways. Uh, that needs to be appreciated. Also, Birbal Sani, uh, you know, Dr. Birbal Sani established the Institute for Paleobotany. Um, and I can just go on and on. Uh, Gurdev Kosh and many others. One of the characteristics of all of them, uh, or, or a common feature of all of them, which we must now change, is all of them went outside Punjab and did their work. Now, there is extraordinary um, cohesion of institutes young people wanting to do great things. And therefore, this is a good time to also have people coming from all over the country into Punjab and people in Punjab doing great science. Is that feasible? I think so. And I'll tell you very briefly why. I'll tell you briefly why in the context of the growth of molecular biology. And that growth of molecular biology is, uh, you know, Hargobind Kharana was the center of it. Now, molecular biology grew for two different kinds of, uh, through two different kinds of threads. The first was work on bacterial genetics and phage genetics. Bacterial phages are, you know, viruses which attack bacteria. 
And because you can, you know, read them as it were in the lab, culture them with such speed, you could unravel the secrets of how genes affect organisms through bacterial genetics and phage genetics. And this was a major uh, thrust which took place uh, both in Europe and in America in the early 50s. Secondly, uh, there was an attempt, successful, by Francis Craig, Jim Watson, with data from Rosalind Franklin's lab uh, and Morris Wilkins to unravel the structure of the DNA. And while there were earlier attempts, the structure of the DNA turned out, and it doesn't have to be so, it turned out to be so extraordinarily beautiful and also potentially revealing of the way information content in the DNA could be moved to create proteins. And that, that was a big challenge. How could that happen? Over a period of a decade, of five years or so, in the 50s, several groups deciphered that there's something called an mRNA, which we talk about a lot now, a messenger RNA, which must lie in between the DNA and the protein which is made. When this was certain, the challenge was how does the code in the DNA, the sequence of letters in the DNA, translate through mRNA to make a protein? And that's the kind of work which uh, Hargobind Khurana, Marshall Nirenberg, and others sorted out, for which Khurana and Nirenberg and Holly got the Nobel Prize, um, I think, in 1968. Now, this unraveling a little later of the complete genetic code was extraordinary. But this feeds back again to simple bacterial genetics on how one can use bacteria to genetically engineer the code from other organisms, put them in bacteria, and express new proteins. And this was the dawn of a new era of biotechnology, but also a new era of genetic manipulation. There were many concerns and fears about the kinds of consequences of genetic manipulation. Pretty much all of them have proven to be excessive. But you know, genetic manipulation today allows us to do extraordinary things and also understand biology. Let me give you one more example, which is relatively recent. And this is again, and all this, by the way, is small science. It's not huge science with huge infrastructure, though the huge science came as a consequence of genetic manipulation. Another example, far more recent, is the ability to manipulate genes using what is commonly known as CRISPR-Cas9 technology. And again, this technology came about by groups of scientists investigating phenomena in bacteria which were considered by many others in society, boring, very fundamental research. But that resulted in a new ability to manipulate DNA. And this again was relatively small science. So the point is that extraordinary applications come about by focusing on things which are exciting, which are interesting. And there is no rule in life sciences or physics or anything which says, that you have to do basic or fundamental science as long as you do interesting science, interesting applications, and really high quality science comes from. One last example, much before all of what I talked about, was the discovery of DNA as a genetic material. That came about not by a quest to find out what is, what is the material which causes heredity, which is responsible for heredity, but it came about by trying to figure out how diseases are spread in drains of London. And then <laughs> the, the study of looking at how uh, pneumococcal bacteria are, uh, yeah, uh, are pathogenic or not resulted in the discovery of DNA by Avery McLeod and McCarthy much later uh, as DNA as a genetic material. So this situation where a search for applied uh, solutions or a search for basic understanding, they often lead to extraordinary, uh, the extraordinary discoveries. Now, in Punjab now, you have a situation where you have at Mohali and Chandigarh a very you know, extraordinary LA, uh, galaxy of institutions. Okay. Pharmaceutical research institutions, I saw Mohali, uh, the School of Business, um, you know, the uh, Nanoscience Institute, um, the engineering colleges and the science colleges. 
And of course, there are lots of discussions going on, which we are interacting with you to see how these institutions can interact and function closely with each other. But at the heart of all of this must be a flexibility where students from any college can take courses in any other college. In today's world of the internet and connectivity through uh, WebEx and so on, they should interact with scientists all over the world. And most importantly, they shouldn't hesitate to ask daring questions. Uh, and students are the ones who can ask daring questions as long as their education is really grounded and deep. They can, they can do that in mathematics and nanoscience, in life sciences and so on and so forth. So there's extraordinary opportunity for Punjab, uh, you know, which will result in applications in health, agriculture, education, uh, and so on. And that leadership uh, must be taken within Punjab. All too often, our attempts at doing quality science are inspired by the best work in the rest of the world, but the best work in the West, and that's good. But we must make sure that that inspiration must be emulative and not imitative. There's no point in imitating everything which Khurana did and suddenly expect to be like him. That will not happen. Khurana's strength was not that he imitated others, but that he did not imitate others. He did his PhD in UK. He was going to do his PhD sent by a government of India agriculture ministry scholarship to study the chemistry of insect cuticle. Unfortunately, just after the war, a very large number of Brits wanted to study those kinds of things, and there was no place over there. So an astute government of India embassy high commission official sent him to study chemistry, organic chemistry instead. And that was perhaps a very major contribution of the government of India in shaping someone's career. Uh, he got him admission for a PhD in organic chemistry. That changed Khurana, Khurana's career enormously. He finished his PhD. Uh, you know, it was just post-independence India. Uh, he could not get a job here uh, in time. And then he went back to Cambridge uh, for a scholarship. But using the scholarship money he saved, he went to Switzerland for a year, not getting paid by his laboratory to understand new kinds of organic chemistry. He was so passionate and curious about that. Then he went to British Columbia and this chemistry was key to his synthesizing nucleic acids and unraveling the genetic. So there is a certain kind of determination and a curiosity not to get a prize, not to you know, be rich and famous, but to actually understand processes. And then all the others are consequences of that. And that's the kind of attitude one needs to um, emulate uh, you know, from uh, uh, Khurana or um, uh, Abdul Salam or Chandrasekhar. I mean, these people really focused on what they wanted to do because of their curiosity, and as a consequence, did great work. So there's enormous opportunity in Mohali to do that kind of work, and I wish you all, all the best, uh, and I'm sure that great science will not only be nurtured in Punjab, but will happen in Punjab. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And uh, you rightly said, in fact, uh, you know, for all the young minds present here, I would like to share that um, uh, Professor Kurana wrote that, uh, you know, he said he was envious of people who knew from the beginning what they wanted to do. And at the time of graduation, when he wanted to enter a stream, he applied for uh, chemistry as well as he applied for English. You know? And uh, he said, I. Uh, and uh, in chemistry, there used to be an interview, so I thought I was very shy. Why go for that interview? But anyway, then they admitted him without interview as well. So that's how he entered into that stream. So and with that spirit of curiosity, as you rightly said, and and I would also like to mention here that uh, uh, thanks to Professor Vijay Raghun, the country is uh, celebrating this week long science fest. Uh, you know, at 75 locations in India, and we have uh, out of those five locations in Punjab here. Uh, and uh, we deliberately have, have planned uh, today's lecture series during this week long science fest. You know. uh, and uh, would like to share with you, uh, Professor Vijay Raghun, that there's so much enthusiasm. 
uh, at uh, all these five locations, all the universities, institutions, NGOs, everybody is involved in this. And you rightly mentioned, in fact, last week only we were at uh, myself, Professor Grover, we were at Punjabi University, uh, Patiala, and Professor Grover, um, you rightly said, the custodian of so much of knowledge about Punjabi scientists uh, precisely spoke on that uh, that aspect. And uh, I also want to share with you that we have already compiled a good lot of information on history of science and technology in Punjab. And uh, we would now be having the brainstormings with the experts and uh, we'll come up with this compilation. It will also include a dedicated session on the scientists from Punjab. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for being here, for encouraging everyone. With that, uh, uh, Professor Grover, may I request you to take it forward and uh, uh, introduce Professor Gagandeep Kang, though she doesn't need any introduction, uh, and also invite her to deliver the lecture. By the way, before uh, Professor Grover comes in, I suggest that the Punjab government uh, lock him up in a room and make him write down the history of Punjab science and release him only after that. Yeah, good morning. <laughs> Thank you <laughs> for your confidence in me and let me see how much I can deliver. So like Chief, our Chief Secretary Anurag Varmaji, I am also feeling privileged to have an opportunity to briefly address all of you on the occasion of 5th INST Punjab State Council of Science and Technology Hargobind Khurana Lecture by Professor Gagandeep Kang in the birth centenary year of Khurana, which serendipitously coincides with the 75th year of Indian independence as well. It's a matter of additional personal delight for me that Professor Vijay Raghavan is the chief guest today. Vijay and I did our PhD together nearly four decades ago at TIFR. And again, incidentally, this is the second occasion Vijay is with us for a Kharana Memorial event. In December 2017, an International Hargobin Kharana Memorial Symposium on Genes, Genomes, and Membrane Biology had been organized at Nabi in Mohali in collaboration with PS, CST, ISA, and INST. Vijay was present on the first day of that symposium. Professor Tom Rajbandari from MIT, a close colleague of Khurana for four decades, had delivered the third Argovin Khurana lecture during that symposium. And he really shared all the anecdotes of his working together with Khurana with the young children. And everybody was so excited. The hall was full of Argovin Khurana scholars of Punjab government, kids who are given scholarship when they are in class 11 and 12 to prepare for pursuing a career in science and technology. So again, it's a matter of pride for us that Professor Gagandeep Kang, the, Kang, the first Indian woman to be elected fellow of the Royal Society, readily consented to deliver today's lecture. In addition to sharing the honor of SRF, FRS, both Vijay and Professor Gagandeep Kang have been recipient of Infosys Science Prize in Life Sciences in the years 2009 and 2016. So we really have a wonderful collection of Indian icons for today's lecture. The Infosys Science Prize had been awarded to Gagandeep Ji for her pioneering contributions to the understanding of natural history of rotavirus and other infectious diseases. In our citation for the Infosys Prize, it was surmised that her findings have enormous implications for vaccines and other public health measures to thwart infections. The Churi Chair had further added that her tremendous achievements in translational and clinical sciences reflect her scientific breadth and depth and her willingness to tackle hard problems pertaining to human health her ability to forge national and international collaborations to take critically needed comprehensive approaches. This is our Gagandeep Ranaji for Gagandeep Kangji for all of you. I may add for the young students in the audience today that Professor Gagandeep was born in Shimla in 1962 and she had her schooling at Jalandhar 
before choosing to join Christian Medical College at Fellot for her MBBS. She had headed the Translation Health Science and Technology Institute in when she was awarded or when she was elected as the Fellow of the Royal Society. She is back at her own laboratory at Pellor at present. She has been very kind to Punjab. She delivered the convocation of ISA online a few years ago. And just a few months ago, she was with us physically, not only delivering the convocation of Punjabi University Patiala, but also interacting with the young uh, students in the hall and that. Thank you, Gagandeep Ji, and we look forward to hosting you physically on behalf of all the Chandigarh institutions, certainly during the 75th year of Indian independence. Thank you very much and over to you. Thank you very much, Professor Grover. It's an honor to be here and to be invited by the Punjab State Council for Science and Technology and the Institute for Nanoscience and Technology. I'm also honored to have uh, Sri Varma and Sri Tiwari here representing the government of Punjab. And of course, um, Dr. Vijay Raghavan is a friend to all of us and to science in India in general. He's also part of one of the two stories that I'm about to tell you. And Professor Patra, once again, thank you so much for um, hosting me here. Um, I'm really sorry, but I can't share content. So perhaps your IT people can enable that. Yes, thank you. So I'm very honored to give a lecture that is named after one of the preeminent Punjabi scientists. Um, my parents, like Hargubim Khurana, were born in what is now Pakistan and then moved over to Punjab during the partition. I'm going to be talking to you to tell you about two stories. The first is to talk to you about vaccine development in general very briefly and then to talk to you about developing two vaccines, one of which is the chimpanzee adenovirus vector vaccine, which is currently the most widely used vaccine in India is Covishield. And the second is to talk to you about the rotavirus vaccine, which was developed when there was no pandemic. Now, in order to be able to make vaccines, Obviously, right now, we think that understanding both structure and function of the causative agent is very important. But if we look back to a little over 200 years ago, Edward Jenner didn't really know what was causing smallpox, but was able to use his observations in order to develop what became the first vaccine. Everybody knows the story of Jenna, but I think as with many other infectious diseases, we forget very quickly how much damage diseases can do. In the 1700s in Europe, at a time when the population was much smaller than it is now, approximately 4 lakh pe people died every year because of smallpox. People were desperate to be able to protect themselves and protect their children. The practice of inoculation had been introduced, learning from what was done in China and India and the Middle East. But Jenna was the first person to take material from the lesions of cowpox that were found on milkmaids inoculate them into his gardener's son, James Phipps, who was eight years old. And he waited two months and challenged him with smallpox. And James did not develop smallpox. And that was the what the first vaccine was based on. Now, initially, vaccine manufacture was challenging. You had to have cows that were infected with cowpox and you had to be able to transport that material 
across great distances in order to be able to make the vaccines. There are fascinating stories that are told of how the vaccine reached the US with cows, infected cows being sailed on ships across the Atlantic. And in India, we were also very quick to set up the making of smallpox vaccines with them being made within less than a decade of Jenner's discoveries. Now, all of that meant that vaccines started to be used very quickly. And in a hundred years, smallpox had been eliminated from much of the industrialized world. In 1959, the WHO began the Global Smallpox Eradication Program, and that required not just a lot of supply of vaccine, but also of innovative strategies, because at that time, vaccination programs were not as advanced as they are today. So the ring vaccination strategy was developed where essentially you had to identify a case of smallpox, vaccinate all the people that that person had been in contact with, and then vaccinate all their contacts. So if you did that, essentially what you were doing is protecting people before they could manifest with disease and transmit it further on. The success of the global program was in that 20 years with these concerted efforts, it was possible for WHO to eradicate smallpox and smallpox is still the only disease in humans that has been eradicated. There is a disease in animals that was also eradicated through vaccination, but if you don't vaccinate, then it can be very difficult to get rid of disease. Now, what can vaccines do to diseases? I'm showing you here examples of two diseases. One is measles and the other is meningococcus in New Zealand. You can see what happened in measles. There were always a lot of cases of measles around. And then as soon as the vaccine is introduced, the number of cases crashes and remains very, very low. Of course, one of the problems as with smallpox and with measles is that when people don't see a disease anymore, then they think that vaccines are no longer necessary. And when you stop using those vaccines, it's very possible that the disease may come back. And we've seen that happen with measles in many parts of the world. On the other side, you see meningococcal cases in New Zealand where you had a low number of cases. And then because of a change in practice, which was essentially students beginning to live in dormitories, uh, and transmitting diseases amongst themselves, they started to be an increase in the number of cases of one kind of meningococcus, the type B meningococcus. And once the vaccine was introduced and widely used, it was possible to bring meningococcus down to very low levels. Now, if we look at what the value of vaccines is, it's been estimated that even without SARS-CoV-2, vaccines prevent two to three million deaths a year. And that means that vaccination prevents five deaths every minute. And this is counting only deaths, not all the sickness that is averted. Now, if we look at the development of vaccines, it is a long, and complicated process. You have to start in a laboratory where you study the disease. You have to identify which is likely to be a good vaccine candidate. Because vaccines depend on the immune response and most of the successful vaccines are dependent on antibodies, the exploratory phase is really about identifying the right antigen and then doing initial studies to make sure that you've understood the pathogen and the antigen appropriately. 
You then take it into preclinical studies where you look at if you have a good animal model, you can look at immune responses, but otherwise you would look at safety in the preclinical studies. You can also look at whether adding another substance, an adjuvant, would improve your immune response. Then we come to the human studies, and here in phase one, usually you start with a small number of people and you look at safety and at immunogenicity. If it's proven safe and immunogenic, then you move on to phase two studies where you evaluate the vaccine in a larger number of people. And here you try to figure out what is the right dose, how many doses should we give, what should the interval between the doses be, and of course you continue to look at safety. Then in phase three, you come to the real challenge for the vaccine. Does it actually prevent the disease that it is targeting? This requires that you evaluate the vaccine in a much larger number of people. And of course, you continue to do safety assessments. Once a phase three is successful, where it has been shown that a vaccine prevents disease in the population, then you can go for registration. But the life cycle of the vaccine does not end there. Because once a vaccine is registered and can be given market authorization, which means that it can be sold in the market, you still have to continue to monitor safety. And you also start to look at the real world effectiveness of the vaccine, because in clinical trials, you use a population that has very strict entry criteria. But in the real world, you're actually going to give this vaccine to the general population where you have people of different ages, people who may have other illnesses, etc. You want to know how the vaccine is working in them. Now, while all of this testing of the vaccine is going on, there's also research and development that is happening with the vaccine manufacturer. So for the exploratory and the preclinical phase, you can start with something that does not necessarily need to meet the same criteria as materials that go into humans. So you can do pilot lots that can be used for initial research and development, but then you have to go into what is called good manufacturing practice, in a facility that is qualified to do this. So these batches initially are made as small batches, which are used for clinical trials. And then you have to be able to scale up those batches so that there is vaccine that will be available for use if and when it is licensed. About, or if we look at all of the vaccines that go into humans, about one in 10 vaccines will actually become a licensed product. So this is a huge challenge and many manufacturers will not begin to make large volumes of vaccine for use in the population until they have gotten to having a product that is likely to be approved by the regulator. So what are the timelines for vaccine development? If you take exploratory and preclinical, two to three years, phase one trials, two to three years, phase two trials, two to three years, phase three trials, two to three years, the whole process of regulatory review and approval, one to two years, and then manufacturing and surveillance. So somewhere between 10 to 15 years is how long an average vaccine takes. So what I'm going to do is now tell you about a vaccine that took considerably less than 10 to 15 years. This is about what we know as Covishield in India and what is known as Vaxzevria in the rest of the world. This is a vaccine that is made by AstraZeneca. And if we take together the AstraZeneca vaccine and the Serum Institute made Covishield, we had last year 2.3 billion doses, 
which means that this was the vaccine along with Sinovac for which most doses were made in the world. So the most widely used vaccine in the world. Now to look at where this vaccine started. This vaccine actually started with two researchers, Adrian Hill and Sarah Gilbert, who have been working together for over 25 years. They work at the Jenner Institute in Oxford, and they've been working on vaccines for a really long time. When Adrian Hill first started out, he wanted to make a vaccine for malaria, and he made many vaccine constructs for malaria. He brought them into actual clinical studies, and most of them failed. But then he learned a lot about how to make vaccines and then started to think about other approaches to make vaccines. And one of the approaches that they landed on was not to focus on just making and delivering the proteins themselves, but looking at approaches to deliver the message for how to make the proteins. So in work that they did for Ebola and for MERS coronavirus, they started to use other technologies as well. And they also started to think about which technology would be most suitable for them. They were thinking about adenovirus vectors because the adenovirus is one that is has very clear, it's easy to work with. It's easy to make into a non-replicating vector. Its genome is large and has a region where it's possible for it to carry segments of another gene. And because it gets into human cells very well, there is a Coxsackie and adenovirus virus receptor on most human cells. So they thought about using an adenovirus vector, but then also had to think about the fact that there are many human adenoviruses. So if you have antibodies to human adenoviruses, will the vaccine adenovirus actually be able to get in? So then they thought maybe what an approach that we could take is to use an adenovirus vector from a related species. And they picked a chimpanzee adenovirus that they got from a researcher in Sweden after unsuccessfully looking for chimpanzee adenoviruses in other parts of the world. And they were able to become very familiar with that adenovirus and how to introduce new genes into the adenovirus vector. So they established a company. The company was called Vaxitech. And Vaxitech worked with a number of different candidates that were either for treatment or for prophylaxis. And for prophylaxis, they were working on a MERS coronavirus with funding that they had received from the pharmaceutical company Janssen and with the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, where the Department of Biotechnology under Dr. Vijay Rathan was a founding member. So because they had been working on a MERS vaccine, when SARS-CoV-2 came along, very quickly they decided that they were going to work on this agent. Now, remember, these are university researchers with a small company that is working on a lot of really very early stage projects. But because it was the University of Oxford and Oxford has a vaccine center, which is headed by Sir Andrew Pollard, they were able to connect to him very quickly. In January of 2020, they designed the new constructs. They made them in February. In April of 2020, they made their CGMP batches, got them ready for trials. 
In May, they started their phase one, phase two trials under uh, Andy. And then by December of 2020, they had the results from the phase three trials and the vaccine had about 65% efficacy. You can see the difference here in the disease shown in red in people who had been given the Chadox a vaccine and the control vaccine was a meningococcal vaccine. Now you would have thought this would be a huge success story, but there were lots and lots of controversies about the AstraZeneca vaccine. Initially, there were questions about the dose that had been given. Now, because this was Oxford and a small company, they were asked to partner with a larger company for scale up. And they chose AstraZeneca because that was at least partially a British company. And they started to work with them. But in the initial phases, there were issues of standardization that resulted in this half dose, full dose controversy. They also, when they started manufacturing and providing the vaccines, there were European lawsuits about supply because the UK was getting supply before European countries that had made a commitment to buy the vaccine. And even though the vaccine was safe in phase one, two and three studies shortly after it began to be used, it was demonstrated that this was a vaccine that had a side effect, which was called thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome. Later, it was shown that uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is also an adenovirus vector vaccine, also had a similar side effect. And the side effects were very rare. They were blown, you know, possibly out of proportion. It, initially and a lot of countries stopped their vaccination programs then reintroduced their vaccination programs then decided some age groups were getting it while other age groups would not get it and in many ways that was an overreaction and in the pandemic we have seen a lot of overreactions but in addition to that AstraZeneca was a company that had not made vaccines before, and they did their um, dissemination of information by press release. The press releases were confusing with varying results in the US trials, and that meant that what is actually an outstanding vaccine got a bad name in the press in many parts of the world. Now, Serum Institute's collaboration to make Covishield had actually begun before AstraZeneca came into the picture. It was a direct collaboration with the University of Oxford. And later, they started to, they had to do an agreement with AstraZeneca as well. In fact, in many ways, Serum's production, Serum's testing, in India, which was on a much smaller scale because it was only studies in about 1600 individuals, went very much more smoothly than what had been happening with this vaccine in the West. However, when this vaccine started to be used in the UK, and here is a comparison of hospitalizations and deaths, Comparing the AstraZeneca and the Pfizer vaccine, you can see that the results were very similar, particularly on the Delta variant. The results on the Omicron variant include all the vaccines together, so it's a little difficult to dissect those out. But nonetheless, this is a good vaccine and it has probably saved many more lives than any other vaccine that we have. In India, we have effectiveness data that shows that Covishield gives us protection against infection and against severe disease, including against Delta, which was a much more challenging strain than the Alpha variant that we had. So in summary, on the first vaccine, a vaccine developed during a pandemic, Academic scientists who were supported well by government and non-governmental sources were able to rapidly develop a new vaccine, which is one of the cheapest vaccines in the world. 
It's one of the vaccines where the maximum number of doses have been given out. It has a rare side effect, but one which can be managed with early recognition and treatment. It's been estimated from Australia that it causes uh, TTS in one in 40,000 vaccinees. And of that, there's a very, very, if it's recognized early, then there's a very, very low mortality rate. So politics and news cycles might have damaged what is an excellent vaccine. And we should really watch the emerging evidence in India and the rest of the world. So this is a comparison of how long it took. We got uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine in less than 10 months. And one of the important things for us to remember is why did this happen? This happened because we had regulators who worked with the vaccine companies to ensure that there were no delays in reviewing the data and to because we did two things in the clinical testing. One of those was to combine phases one and two and phases two and three. The second was to conduct very, very large clinical trials so that we could get the data as quickly as possible. So no compromise on estimation of safety or efficacy in these vaccines, but some missteps when it came to communication. So moving from there, I'd like to talk about vaccines not in a pandemic. And if we look at vaccine use in industrialized countries, they use 60% of the vaccines, even though their infectious disease burden for non-pandemic diseases is a lot less than ours. And we really need to think about changing that paradigm. Indian vaccine companies have tried to do this. One of the strongest industries that we have in India is the vaccine industry that it delivers vaccines for routine immunization of children in the low and middle income countries. 60% of the vaccines procured by the Gavi Alliance Seth Berkeley, the CEO is shown here, are uh, made by Indian companies. This is about 40% of all the vaccines that were made in the world prior to uh, SARS-CoV-2. But actually, in terms of value, these have very low market share. Now, moving to rotavirus, which is what I've worked on for the last 25 plus years. It is a virus that causes um, dehydrating gastroenteritis and the youngest children, unfortunately, are the worst affected because they can die very easily of dehydration. And before we had wide vaccine rollout, rotavirus was the number one cause of diarrheal disease deaths. About 10% of all children under five were dying of diarrhea and 37% of all deaths were due to rotavirus. In India, we've had a surveillance program run with the national, uh, with the ICMR. And here our figures are very similar to the rest of the world, where 36% of all hospitalized uh, diarrhea cases in children are due to rotavirus. So it was very clear to us that we needed a vaccine, but we needed to have a vaccine that we knew would work and that we could afford. The development of rotavirus vaccines had started almost as soon as rotavirus was discovered as a human pathogen in 1973. And candidates began to be evaluated from the 1980s. There were a bunch of candidates that were made but the first vaccine that was actually licensed was the Rota Shield vaccine that was licensed in the US. And about a year after it began to be used in children in the US, they found that it had a side effect, intersusception, which happened one week after the first dose of the vaccine. So the Rotashield was withdrawn 
but then they had to develop new and safer vaccines and two vaccines were developed and these were licensed in 2006 they had to do very very large trials these vaccines were developed by Merck and GSK and interestingly both the vaccines were priced very similarly when they came out at about $200 per course this would have obviously we couldn't afford to uh, to pay a price like that so we had to think about developing our own vaccine and we had our own vaccine in development at the time. Shown here is Professor M.K. Bhan, who was responsible for the early investigations that identified at Ames a neonatal strain of rotavirus in 1985, where he did the studies to characterize the strain and also showed that if you were infected with this strain, you had protection from rotavirus diarrhea subsequently. This strain was brought under the Indo-US Vaccine Action Program that supported the characterization of the strain both in US and in India, and took this forward. Remember 1985 discovery of the strain, early 1990s, it comes under the Indo-US Vaccine Action Program. It gets taken to the US, lots are made in the US, phase one trials are done in the US adults and children. And then after the withdrawal of the Rotashield vaccine, it comes back to India and in 1999 is handed to Bharat Biotech for further development. The phase two studies start to be done in India in the early 2000s, and in the phase three studies begin around 2009 at three sites in Delhi, in Pune, and in Velo. These studies were extremely challenging because it's difficult to do a placebo controlled uh, study when there are licensed vaccines in the market. But ultimately, we were able to get results that demonstrated that these vaccines were efficacious and worked. During the time that Dr. Vijay Raghavan was secretary of DBT, these results became available and the vaccine was licensed under the Indian Regulatory Authority in 2014. But, you know, this vaccine, it wasn't straight shooting to get this vaccine into the program either. This was initially a lyophilized product where the company had developed it to fit into the space that was taken by oral polio vaccines in the freezer. But the program said, we don't want this kind of vaccine. It has too big a volume. We can't use it. So there was an urgent need to conduct a study that did not have such a large volume, which meant removing the buffer for the vaccine. Those studies were done. They showed no difference in immunogenicity. The regulator approved it. And then we wound up with the vaccine in the program. Now, at the same time, a second Indian rotavirus vaccine was being developed. This was based on a strain that was developed by the NIH. It was licensed to Serum Institute of India in 2005, and they conducted a number of studies in India where they showed first phase one, then phase two and phase three studies, finally showed in 2017 that this was an efficacious vaccine. And both of these vaccines then became WHO pre-qualified in 2018. This means they are available now, not only for India, but for all of the developing world. The Rotacil vaccine has been evaluated in Africa in a phase three study as well, and shows good efficacy. And for both Indian made vaccines, they're being evaluated in many places. Now, these are success stories. But for rotavirus vaccines, what we frequently forget is that there was also a failure. Chanta started with the same vaccine construct as serum. They actually had a head start 
they did phase one, phase two studies, and then they did phase three studies that looked really good. But ultimately, this was a vaccine that was unable to demonstrate non-inferiority to a comparator vaccine, and that vaccination program was actually halted. So we tried three vaccines, but we had two successful vaccines after that. Now, when you have vaccines, you need policy to be able to get them into the program. And what the NTAGI, the National Technical Advisory Group on Immunizations, looks at is whether there's disease burden, whether the disease is a priority, whether it's recommended by WHO, and whether use of the vaccines promotes equity. And for rotavirus, there was clearly enough data to be using the vaccine, but there continued to be safety concerns. Nonetheless, again, Dr. Vijay Raghavan was co-chair of the NTAGI at the time that the policy recommendation was made. And in 2016, the vaccine was introduced into the program. So first we had the Rotavac vaccine and from 2018 onwards, we have had the Rotacil vaccine as well. By the end of 2019, all uh, Indian children born in the country today are eligible to receive three doses of rotavirus vaccine from the program. Now, what does this mean? Um, this, we have to look at real world again. How much disease does the vaccine remove? Is there a risk of intersusception? And um, how much is it? Well, we've been doing the studies I'm sorry, I'm having trouble moving my slides now. And I'm on my last three slides. So could someone help me with this? IT team may please uh, look into it. Someone called Ashu has asked for permission to annotate. Sandeep, can you look into it quickly? Or you might want to stop sharing and share again. That might work. Yeah, yeah. I'll try that. So when there's a large footfall on the you know, WebEx platform and so on, then sometimes you know, some issues come. Mm. Okay. Um, right. So this is the impact of rotavirus vaccines in India. As vaccination coverage goes up, shown in the dotted line, the percentage of rotavirus positives comes down. And this has now been uh, monitored in multiple states, multiple locations, and the signals are very clear. The vaccine is working. So what's the summary? India has developed two vaccines made in India and now WHO pre-qualified and usable around the world. Sorry, they're being used in the national, one is being used in the national program in 10 states, the other in all the other states. And it's estimated that these vaccines now save 30,000 children's lives every year in India alone. So looking towards the future, you know, I think vaccines are wonderful. I hope you do too. But there is a lot more that vaccines can do. We can think about vaccines for different kinds of society, vaccines that specifically address equity, that address outbreaks, that address travelers, that chronic diseases. We are thinking about vaccines now for cancer, for autoimmune diseases, for drug addiction, for antimicrobial resistance. But we can also think about vaccines for every age and stage. So far, we have been very limited. 
in the vaccines that we have given. We've given them largely to infants and children, and we give the tetanus and uh, diphtheria vaccines in pregnancy, but we are not extracting all of the value that vaccines have. So looking towards the future, I think vaccines have transformed public health in the 20th century. We've seen the value of vaccines with SARS-CoV-2 for communicable disease. There are opportunities also in non-communicable diseases. Vaccines work and we need to ensure that when we begin to think about Indian science and technology, we make vaccines part of the picture. There was a reference earlier from the Chief Secretary to Atma Nirbharta. We've demonstrated our capabilities. Now we need to demonstrate that we are at the forefront of vaccine science as well. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. <laughs> Awestruck, <laughs> speechless. Uh, thank you uh, for instilling this confidence in everybody by mentioning that vaccines avert five deaths every minute. Also sharing uh, the two stories, the response of scientific community to global pandemic and uh, uh, scientific community's contribution uh, in making rotavirus available to every child in India and the way now, uh, you know, we are contributing towards Atmanibhar Bharat. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, would you like to take some questions? A couple of them. I saw there are a few in the chat. Just a few will pick up. Sure. No problem. Yeah. Dr. Bakshit, uh, if you can uh, quickly take three, four questions from the chat and post to Dr. Kang. Mm. Uh, sure, ma'am. Uh, so I would like to inform that we have been also joined by uh, 250 plus students who are from schools and their teachers. So there are some basic questions also. So maybe I would like to take them first. Uh, some of these students have uh, tried to ask what is the role of actuate in vaccine development? And one wants to know what is the difference between phase one and phase two trials. So they are from the students of the school. Sure. Uh, you know, an adjuvant is a substance that you add to the vaccine to improve the immune response to the vaccine. The oldest adjuvant that we have, one that is very widely used in many vaccines is alum. And there are new adjuvants that have been developed and are in use. In general, if you have a vaccine that is a live vaccine, you don't need an adjuvant because it gets in, it replicates for a while, and your immune system has time to make an immune response. If you have a vaccine that is based on a protein, then it is likely that you are going to need an adjuvant to immune, improve the immune response. So if I can give you an example of a vaccine that is using a new adjuvant, Covaxin, has both alum and a substance that has been included to shape the immune response. So Covaxin was the first vaccine to use that adjuvant. We also have a new vaccine that has been licensed by, uh, very recently licensed by the regulator, Corbivax. And Corbivax uses an adjuvant called CPG. So there are many kinds of adjuvants that are available now. And the purpose of an adjuvant is to improve the immune response, either in terms of polarizing the immune response or in terms of increasing uh, the duration for which antibodies persist. The second question on the difference between phase one and phase two trials of vaccines, the phase one trial is the first trial. So you're putting something 
that has never been in humans before into humans. What's the first thing you want to do? You want to make sure that it's absolutely safe. So usually phase one trials are safety trials. They are done in a very small number of healthy people, usually in about 10, 20 people, not more than that, and usually in adults. Once you know that a vaccine is safe in this group of people, then you can think about using it in a larger number of people. And then you can then you move to phase two trials. Now, in phase one trials, while you're doing safety, you can also measure the immune response. But there, when you are measuring the immune response, because it's small numbers, you don't capture the range of variation in the immune response that you might see. So in phase two trials, which are usually in somewhere between 20 to 100 subjects, you will get a broader range of immune response and you can do many kinds of phase two studies. You can do studies that look at two doses versus three doses. You can do studies that look at dosing intervals. Should I wait one month? Should I wait two months between doses of vaccines? Um, you could look at what the best adjuvant is. You can look at different doses of the vaccine. So there's lots that you can do during the phase two trial. What you're trying to do is to make sure that you learn enough about the vaccine before you take it into phase three studies where you will test the vaccine's ability to actually prevent disease. So phase two is a series of studies that are intended to optimize um, the vaccine. And the way you measure that optimization is usually by measuring the antibody response. So which combination, which dosing schedule gives you the best antibody response? Thank you, ma'am. I think, uh, Dipinder, to remain within the confines of time, actually our teams have uh, WhatsApp groups also with the schools, separate with the colleges and research institutions. Besides a lot of questions which have poured in the chat here, there are a lot of questions in the WhatsApp groups also. The large number of people have joined through YouTube also. So what we'll do, they'll consolidate questions and uh, you know, our teams will try to address those in the WhatsApp groups. Uh, thank you, Dr. Khan, once again. Thank you. And uh, I'll now request Dr. Amit Patra, Director, Institute of Nanoscience and Technology, to propose a formal vote of thanks. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jitan Kaur. Good morning to all. and. Uh, <clears throat> It's a, it's a great honor and privilege to offer the vote of thanks uh, on the occasion of fifth Haragovindu Khurana lecture organized by INST and Punjab State Council for Science and Technology. And it's a really great pleasure because INST is very newly born uh, research institute in India. It, is a, it was established in 2013. And uh, the, our motto or our activities uh, uh, mainly emphasizing on the cutting edge research and technology based on uh, nano science with the interdisciplinary flavor, uh, mainly in the area of energy, environment, healthcare, agriculture, and quantum materials. So, with the motto uh, of uh, knowledge of uh, science for the nation and uh, nano science for the nation, the INST is uh, steering. Uh, ahead and advancing knowledge and educating young minds uh, in nano science and technology that will the best uh, serve operations. And uh, so uh, that is a great opportunity uh, that uh, Punjab State Council for Science and Technology given us and we have started begins in 2013. So at the first and foremost, I express my gratitude and thanks to Professor Vijay Raghavan, the principal secretary, scientific advisor to the government of India, uh, who has found uh, the time to grace this occasion despite his busy schedule. I also express my uh, heartfelt thanks to Sri Anurag Bharma, principal secretary of science, technology, and environment, 
Government of Punjab and C. Oniruddha Tiwari, Chief Secretary, Government of Punjab, for their kindness and gracious uh, presence. We obviously uh, express our gratitude and thanks to Professor Gavandi uh, for his excellent uh, first uh, accepting our invitation to give the fifth uh, Haragovindu Korana lecture. And uh, thank you, uh, Professor Gagundi, uh, for such scholarly and educative talk. Uh, and you have uh, teach us that how to translate our basic research to the translational research. The history of COVID vaccine is a really amazing thing. It's a really goosebump comes uh, to us uh, actually that we are really scared last two years. Uh, what is COVID? What we don't know anything. Though I am not in biology, but still, after listening all this uh, journey, that COVID history, that India has made a contribution significant to the world history or the world science, uh, that's hats off to you and our uh, uh, Professor Vijay Raghavan's guidance. And we really, really looking forward to for this kind of guidance for the Indian science to grow in future. And uh, obviously, I must thanks to uh, Dr. Jitendra Kaur, the executive director, for his uh, for her initiative and kind support for all, the, all, all for this kind of events. Always, uh, uh, I am receiving phone calls from her, very energetic and very generous to us. And obviously, Professor uh, Arun Gover, the ex VC Punjab University, and I know very well. Uh, from, uh, from the beginning of the INST, was associated with us, and all the time he was guiding, supporting, all the time being things. In fact, we are going to uh, organize the bilateral meeting with the ISAR, INST, with their grandchild, with the CSIO, also with the INST. So I, I, look, I would like to thank the, all the committee members, because in very short notice, we have organized this thing. For their value and support. We have worked hard to ensure the success of this event. And finally, I leave with this inspiring uh, quote uh, by Epi Abdul Kalam that when learning is purposeful, creative blooms. When creativity blooms, thinking emanates. When thinking emanates, knowledge is full lit. When knowledge is economic, economic. Uh, so that is the column. So this is our new generation. So you always need uh, the help from everybody. And I, I request uh, Professor Vijay Raghavan and Sir uh, Raghavandi, please visit our new institute and new campus. And uh, now I think after this listening this talk after COVID vaccine. We are free to move, and uh, we should be uh, very much, uh, we will be very happy to host all of you to our issue. And uh, once again, I thank you all for your valuable time and attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.